Right, I'm going to teach you about fuses and circuit breakers. Here's the learning objectives. You've got to know what is a fuse and how does it work? What is a circuit breaker and how does it work? What are the advantages and disadvantages of fuses and circuit breakers? And how to calculate the size of a current and choose the correct fuse to use. So, there's a picture of a fuse anyway. It's just a skinny bit of wire inside this glass cartridge and it's got two big connections on the end so it can become part of a circuit. It forms the weakest link in a circuit so if there's a sudden surge in current which means if the current suddenly increases this fuse will burn out rather than your telly. Fuses are much cheaper than your telly so it's better that the fuse burns out rather than your telly. And the fuse goes inside the plug, which is what I've talked about in a previous video. The fuse is connected to the live wire because the live wire, the brown one, is what brings the current in to the appliance. Right, so now that you know what a fuse is, how does a fuse work? So a fuse is a thin piece of wire designed to be the weakest link in a circuit. A three amp fuse is designed to blow or melt if more than three amps of current passes through it. Now you can get all sorts of different sizes of fuses. I'm just showing you a three amp fuse here as an example. This can be worth three or four marks sometimes in an exam and this is kind of what you need to tell the examiner. So this is how a fuse works. If a higher current than the fuse rating goes into the fuse, so this particular fuse I'm talking about is a uh, three amps, the fuse will get hot, because you know current makes the wires get hot, and it'll melt. And as it melts, so it would like snap here, it breaks the circuit by causing a gap. Now, the good thing about that is it saves the user from getting an electric shock, it stops the device from overheating and becoming damaged, and it could also stop a fire from starting. Now it's always the same pattern. You'll see how a circuit breaker is very similar to a fuse in a minute. Now, just in case the examiner asks you about disadvantages of fuses, well, the fuse wire, once it's blown, right, don't say blow up, it's not a bomb, but you can say the fuse wire is blown. Once the fuse wire is blown, it's now broken, and so the fuse would need replacing. You'd have to replace this. So hopefully you've got a spare one in your kitchen drawer. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have to go out to B&Q or one of these other hardware stores and buy a replacement. So that is a bit of a disadvantage. And also, you've got to fix the problem that caused the fuse to blow in the first place. Or the new fuse will experience the same problem and it'll just blow straight away. So if you did go to B&Q, let's hope you bought more than one replacement in case it just blows again. Right. Uh, advantages of fuses? The cheap. Basically the cheap. Right. Let's have a look at uh, this circuit breaker and see how that works. So this is a modern circuit breaker. It's got a great big switch on it. Uh, it's basically a circuit breaker contains an electromagnet and a contact which protects the user and appliance like a fuse, but it's better. Right, so I'm going to talk about the 3 amp circuit breaker. Once again, just like the fuse though, you can get all sorts of sizes of circuit breakers. 5 amps, 7 amps, 10 amps, 13 amps. Right, a 3 amp circuit breaker is designed to trip. That's what we call when this uh, switch sort of trips. It goes to the other side. It's designed to trip if more than three amps passes through it. And this is how. If a higher current than the circuit breaker rating goes into the circuit breaker, an electromagnet inside the circuit breaker becomes a stronger magnet and attracts the metal contact. And that causes a gap and breaks the circuit. And once again, just like the fuse, this saves the user from getting an electric shock it stops the device from overheating and becoming damaged and stops a fire from starting. Right, I've made a circuit breaker. I'm going to open it up and I'm going to have a little sneaky peek and see what's inside. 
Right, so I've took the outer casing off and this is basically what we've got. Now, I'll put some labels on to show you what's what and how it works. Right, look at all these labels. Let's talk you through it because it looks a bit complicated now, doesn't it? <laughs> right, this is where your current comes in. This is like a copper wire, right? And then it comes along an iron and it's a fixed contact. That basically means it's not going to move, right? So the current obviously comes down here because iron is a conductor. It comes down through there because these two contacts are, well, the contact, aren't they? <laughs> right? So that's your, that's your contact. It's going to act like a switch. Now that is because this contact can rock. It's iron again and it'll rock. Look at that. It's got a pivot there. And again, this part can come down. I'll show you in a second. And this part will come up. Right, but just for now, the current's coming down through here. It's coming down through this bit. It's coming along here. Ah, it's going into this uh, copper wire. Now, this copper wire is coiled around a soft iron core, okay? Now, this is basically an electromagnet. All that an electromagnet is, is wires wrapped around a soft iron core, okay? So this here is the electromagnet bit, and then the current just comes down there like a helter skelter, and then comes out there, okie dokie. Right, let me turn a little bit of current on and I'll show you what's gonna happen. Now, so I've put a little bit of a current in here. It's these dotty yellow lines, right? You can see the current's going round and round and round and coming out. Now, this is important. Do you know that when an electric current flows through a wire, it actually creates a magnetic field around the wire, right? Check out my lessons on electromagnets. Now, watch, let us put the, uh, here's the magnetic field, this blue thing then, right? So you can see, because it's just a small current, it's only a small magnetic field. And the magnetic field isn't quite strong enough to start pulling down and attracting this iron rocking contact, right? So what I'll do, is I'm going to put, I'll turn that current off, hang on, and then that'll turn the magnetic field off. Now, I'm going to put a bigger current in, check this out. Oof, size of that, right? Now, what do you think's going to happen? If I put a bigger current in, what do you think's going to happen to the size and the strength of the magnetic field? You've guessed it, the magnetic field is going to be bigger and stronger. Now, look at it's going right up and it's now able to attract this iron rocking contact. So let us show you what's going to happen. Although you can probably work it out for yourself. This whole contact is going to start getting pulled downwards like that. Okay. Now don't worry about the spring. The spring shouldn't have went up. It's just the animation, right? Now, look at there's There's no contact now between these two points. So basically that's acted like a switch and it's gonna switch off the current. Now let me just adjust this slightly, watch this. There, that's what it's gonna look like, okay? Now this spring is pulling on that bit there. Because the contact has been broken now, the electric current can't get down into the electromagnet. So the electromagnet is not going to be a magnet anymore. And because the magnet's not a magnet anymore, that means that this is no longer going to be attracted. So the magnetic field's going to turn off, and that's because the current's turned off. Now, what I should have drawn on here is there's something here that's actually stopping this from coming back down. So it just stays like this. Now, if I turn the outer case back on, you can see that this little switch has popped up, and that's a little reset button. Now the beauty of the circuit breakers is that once you've fixed the problem, you just literally press that reset button, and then you're good to use the circuit breaker again. So that's an advantage of the circuit breaker. You don't need to replace it. You simply reset the button. Or in this case up here, so when it trips, this switch would trip down, and then fix the problem, and you just flick the switch back up. So it's a reset button, that's lovely. And it would just take it back to how it was before. So an advantage of the circuit breakers is that the circuit breaker does not need replacing, like a fuse would. 
You simply fix the problem that caused the circuit breaker to trip and then press the reset button to reconnect the metal contacts. They are more reliable as they trip faster at the stated current rating. Basically just means they're more sensitive. If it says that it's going to trip at 3 amps, it trips at 3 amps straight away. Rather than like the fuse where it gets to 3 amps and then the wire has to get hot enough and then it breaks. Disadvantages of the circuit breaker, basically it's more expensive than a fuse. Now, in your exams you might get asked how to select the correct fuse to use. And it's easy. To select the correct fuse, just pick a fuse that's slightly bigger than the normal working current. So, what do I mean? Right, look, here's some common fuse sizes. You can get 1 amp fuse, 3 amp fuse, 5 amp, 10 amp, 30 and 15, 30 amp fuses, right? If a kettle needs 11 amps to work, you need to choose a fuse that's slightly bigger than 11 amps. So, that would be the 13 amp fuse. Now, the device will be okay with slightly more current than it needs, right? So if it needs 11 amps, it'll be all right with uh, 13 amps. If there's suddenly a current surge for a short amount of time, right? So if there's a sudden increase in current for a short amount of time, your kettle will not blow up, right? Your kettle will not be damaged by a little bit extra. If it's more current for a long amount of time, the fuse will do its job and it'll blow and it'll protect your kettle or whatever electrical appliance you're using. Now, what about this though? You might say, well, how do you know the kettle needed 11 amps to work in the first place? Is there a way of working out how much current an appliance needs? Right, I'm glad you've asked that question. <laughs> so in your exams, the examiner might want you to first calculate how much current a device needs to work, which is what we call its normal working current. Then you'll need to select the correct fuse to use. So a typical question. A kettle uses 230 volts from the mains supply and it's rated at 2.5 kilowatts. Now remember that's 2,500 watts. What size fuse does it need? First calculate how much current the kettle needs to work. So it's working current. We do that by using this equation. Power equals current times by voltage. P-I-V. PIV. <laughs> I've got a, a nice video all to do with that. Let's rearrange it so the current is going to equal the power divided by the voltage. So the power was 2,500 watts. Make sure that's in watts, not kilowatts. And then divide that by the voltage, which was 230 volts. And that comes out, it rounds up to 10.9 amps. Right. So that's how much current the kettle needs. Then we simply select the correct fuse to use. So if the normal working current's 10.9 amps, choose a fuse slightly bigger than 10.9. So yeah, that's why we went for the 13 amps before and it's still relevant now, isn't it? So there you go. The fuse to use would be 13 amps because it's slightly bigger than 10.9 amps. Boom. How would you like them apples? So I hope that video was helpful for you. If there's any way that you think I can improve my videos, if you want us to add some more questions for you to try or something like that, just comment below. But apart from that, Subscribe to the channel, smash that like button, and I'll see you in the next video. Work hard, be nice, and bye for now.